Well, it's mid-morning on a beautiful late, early to late autumn day here in Southland on the south coast of the South Island of New Zealand. And I'm standing in a very sunny spot in a glade in an open part of the forest garden. Uh, it's a place I like to come to and just sit and relax and ruminate on, on what it is that's happening in here. Because it's so light, uh, it feels open and I can look around and see. It's also right on the edge of the, uh, on the, edge of the native forested area, opening out into the, where we have most of our food plants, our fruit trees and our vines growing. So it's a very dynamic place to sit and think about things. It's also got some very special plants in this area which I like to check on, such as this kawakawa just here. Kawakawa is a good example of a plant that can grow quite well here in Southland, even though we're cool temperate climate and some of our weather is, is a little bit inclement for a plant like kawakawa, which is normally grows uh, well north of here in the North Island largely. But it loves it in here because this bowl of light and warmth is a microclimate and a number of plants here like the kawakawa do very very well uh, under these conditions. Surprisingly because outside of the garden um, plants like like this kawakawa would um, would die over winter. As well as this in here I've got a number of other plants that I enjoy just keeping an eye on. Um, this very large leafed um, cabbage tree over here Cabbage tree is a very unfortunate name for a, for a native New Zealand plant, I feel. Um, it's named, it's, it has a Māori name, it's called Toi, and its uh, Latin name is Cordeline indivisa. It's a mountain cabbage tree. Curiously enough, it too likes to grow here in the forest garden. And one of the things that's really striking about a garden like this is the number of quite distinctive specialist spots that, that present themselves almost um, that allow you to grow such things, um, things that are cold uh, sensitive or things like the mountain cabbage tree that need a little bit of um, extra cold and I can't really work out why it is. Uh, it almost seems, I almost wonder if it's the connection through to all of the other trees and the vitality of the soil that comes from the management such as it is um, that we have operating here in the forest garden. What I mean by that is the interfacing, the interaction, the interweaving of the root systems of all of these trees and the fungal system, the mycorrhizal fungal, fungi and the other fungi that exist in the soil here all seem to contribute to a kind of health which is very hard to describe but is, presents itself in the health of the plants. So it's not something I really knew much about when we first started with this style of gardening but I see evidence of it more and more the more the garden matures. And this garden has matured, it's now almost 30 years old. Um, the oldest trees went in around, around that time but I'm constantly planting, so it's difficult to describe exactly how old the garden is because it's constantly refreshing, which is a very interesting concept. It seemed to me in the early days that there would be a finite number of plants, particularly trees that you could put in a forest garden, and maybe after five or ten years you might have reached the limit or we might have reached the limit. In fact, that's not the case, and it seems now despite the number of trees and the volume of vegetation here, that there are more opportunities now for planting than there were at the beginning. In the early days, we, the site was very exposed, exposed to the southern winds, the southwesters from, from the cold southern ocean. Um, and that really suppressed the growth quite a lot. Now that that's held at bay by, by just by the sheer volume of the amount of tree uh, forest that there is here, a whole new iteration of a new family of plants um, I find now can, can be planted successfully in here. And I notice that particularly with the vines. So vines like grapes, certainly hops, which, which can grow in, in adverse conditions, but grapes, um, passion fruit would be a good example of vines that we can now, kiwi fruit, that we can grow up 
uh, through the into the canopy essentially without any particular extra care such as the the moderating effect of having having a, a lightish canopy overhead and a denser canopy at ground level so even if some uh, even if some plants some vines do die back after the first winter there's enough of them left there um, and with their roots supported by by that network under the soil that they'll spring away again the following year and um, and then take their place up amongst the trees. In here, as you look around, you would be able to see several um, native trees. Earlier on in the piece, it was a lot thicker with native trees. In fact, the whole forest was um, really built on a, on a framework of native trees. But as time's gone by and we've added the fruit trees and other uh, food producing plants in this main part of the forest garden, I've removed a lot of those native trees. I haven't wasted them. I, they've been turned into firewood or walking sticks or staves or, or some kind of craft um, of the sort that you might find in a in, you know, British uh, woodland setting. So nothing's been wasted. And on that issue, the issue of what do you do with branches, what do you do with prunings and so on, because there's a lot in a garden like this, in a forest like this, the best thing that I've found to do with, and I've learnt this over time, is to let them lie on the ground. Let them lie where they fall, because that way they become eventually integrated into the soil through the action of fungi largely, a whole range of fungi, some of which eat eat wood or eat lignin. Uh, that's what they do, that's what their job is, break down that wood bark, branches, trunks, right down into the soil and then just add to that humus layer, that humic layer, which is so good at capturing rain um, and, and holding those water molecules in the soil rather than having to have some kind of reservoir or water collection system that you'd build, construct such as water tanks or even um, any kind of bunding or shaping of the landscape is totally unnecessary in my view where we have a lot of lignin in the soil as a result of, of the constant fall of branches and twigs and so on um, from the higher trees. So the general effect of a gardening style like this, of a forest gardening style, is nothing is wasted, everything is added to and the amount of life in the soil just proliferates. It's a, it's a marvellous feeling to be in an environment like this. It, to me, feels very alive. I'm going to walk uh, around the garden now at a relatively slow pace, stop here and there and talk about different features. Most of those features will be plants, I think, in terms of plants. Um, but underneath all that, there's this other structural management, and I'll, I'll refer to that a little bit as we go around. But there's been a lot of um, work done with permaculturalists and forest gardeners, food foresters, about the processes and about the reasons why they plant, for example, leguminous trees or comfrey, deep-rooted comfrey and so on. So I won't talk too much about that because that's quite well known now. So. Through here, um, where it starts to get perhaps a little, um, the light is more dappled than it was before. There's still remnants of the New Zealand native forest, for example, this um, uh, what they call a bush flax or an astelia. So while they serve no particular purpose, overt purpose, in other words, we can't pick fruit off it or, or make anything from the leaves because they're not strong enough. They're not as strong as harakeki or certainly um, tikoka cabbage trees. But what they do have is they have a cluster of um, orange berries that forms at the base of the plant, which I've tasted them and they're not particularly special, special at all to humans, but to thrushes. They're absolutely divine, it seems, because I quite often find a, a thrush which has taken up residence in the base of an astelia and will sit seemingly all day feeding off those all off, off those berries. So a lot of the qualities of plants may not at first be known, 
uh, but it's only after spending time with them in a garden like this where you can take your time just to observe that you can see things like a thrush with its, um, you know, with its dappled breast tucked in underneath a plant like an Astelia happily feeding. One of the issues I do have now after 30 years of um, growing trees is that some of them are getting very big and this is an example here of one that's giving me a not, a, not concern but it's giving me pause for thought. This is a tree which I planted um, very early on with the understanding that it would produce fruit and it does. I'm not exactly sure of its name but I'm calling it a Russian cherry. I was told it was a Russian cherry. I haven't really researched it to find out if that is the case. It has very small fruits on it which are edible but not delicious. So a lot of things we hear about, trees that are recommended for forest gardening or food foresting, they're edible for sure but they're not necessarily palatable. Not that that really matters if you're wanting to feed the birds which we certainly do here and this is an example of that but the size that it's gotten to now is so great that I'm regularly cutting large branches off that and because I've devoted or committed myself to um, only using hand tools, nothing powered, nothing electrical, nothing petrol driven, then once a tree gets to be this girth, a trunk of this girth, then I'm presented with something of a problem. So it's a matter of ongoing early intervention, managing these trees so that they don't become too huge. Willows are a good example of a tree that if left to grow can become unmanageably large and then present a real difficulty when the time comes to remove them. Um, and that's what's happened to this tree. Because it was so planted so early on I, and I didn't really understand the idea of coppicing and poly, uh, pollarding as a management technique in a forest garden, it's gotten too big. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a younger friend who's an arborist to come in and clamber up there with his safety gear on and start taking off some of these larger branches and perhaps remove this tree entirely. Though it becomes a bit of a moral dilemma at this stage. This tree's been here a long time and it's, you know, it's performed a ter terrific role. So some of those ideas, thinking about trees in a different way, rather than just as a production unit or as something we can harvest from, that's, uh, I wouldn't say a dilemma necessarily, but it's something that occurs to, it occurs to me after living in this forest for, for as long as we have, and I wouldn't have really thought of it uh, earlier on. Just in front and around this tree though, there's a whole community of um, seemingly more useful plants and they're losing their leaves now. This is a black currant. Uh, it's a red currant in fact. The smell of the leaf is different. Um, it's, it's produced a lot of fruit for us over the season. Um, but now, it's, as, as I said, it's autumn and so it's losing its leaves and looking quite open. And just in behind it's a very uh, interesting plant not so much a useful plant in that it's not edible, it's in the parsley family, it's called Madeira giant black parsley and while you can't eat anything from it, it, is a great, it produces marvellous flowers in, in the style of apiaceae or the old uh, umbelliferae, those umbrella shaped flowers with the little open petals that are so um, attractive to hoverflies and the little Newman wasps and so while we can't eat it, it provides our um, pest, uh, insect pest management service and that those hoverflies come in, feed on the little open flowers and then go off looking for protein and protein being aphids or the ichneumonoid wasps which can also feed from the nectar on that plant will go out and lay their eggs into aphids or into the bodies, soft bodies of caterpillars. So why <laughs> Very useful plant, very beautiful as well, a lovely spreading aspect to them. They are short-lived, they only live three or four years um, in total, uh, but once they're gone then of course underneath you can see there are young ones springing up underneath. So the other thing we don't have to do much of nowadays at all is consciously plant plants like that, particularly in that family, because they spread themselves around um, however they want to go. It's, and it's a lovely surprise to find the way plants like that, that family, drift 
drifts around the garden, so to speak, and pops up in areas that I might not have considered. I really like at this stage the, um, the potential that comes from randomness. And whether that's randomness, by the way, the garden uh, spreads its, its own seed around, or whether it's a randomised process of, I like to say to guests sometimes, people who visit, here's a, here's a, here's, here are six trees, take them and plant them wherever you like, because that gives me um, a surprise when I eventually find out where they are. It involves people in the garden, because a garden like this is not designed, although it was originally designed to be a haven or a, um, a refuge. Uh, it's not like that at all. Now it um, involves people very much, whether they're casual visitors doing a tour through the garden or people who might be staying longer. I really like the idea of giving, giving everybody who comes here some real input into the design of the garden, which is nice because it's gradually undoing the original plan that I had for the garden in terms of an aerial view and how things might flow and where the main trees might be. That's changed a lot over time. And even the way the paths uh, run changes constantly. So this path that I'm standing on now might become redundant this season and the new pathway will flow um, nearby or in a different direction, depending on somebody coming along and, and noticing that things have changed and taking a new path. Often it's children who do that and I keep an eye on that and if, if a new path becomes apparent I start using it and I can plant out this one which is you know has made itself more open because of because of being a path. Further down through here um, there are the first evidence of the first of the vines you can see uh, clambering up through this native patti here is a, um, this is a hop. And hops are one plant that, oh, I really love a hop, it's a beautiful plant. The family that it comes from, of course, is a very interesting family. And it grows so vigorously and fills space so quickly. And then when we get further around, I'll show you the um, flowers that, that form on the hop plant. They're all out at the moment. so. Beer brewers of beer, brewers of anything, I suppose, will be quite would be quite interested to walk around here at the moment and just see how those hop flowers form themselves. They're very, very beautiful. Uh, but the hop is one. There are some hop flowers just up here. You can see a light flowering there, but some of the others are heavily flowering. Um, the hop is a plant with a number of uses, medicinal uses, and this is something I do think about quite a lot in the garden. Um, and that is medicinal properties of plants. Not that we have to use those plants very much at all. We seem very healthy, uh, the people who live here, my wife and I, and our children, and, and people who spend a lot of time here, seem very healthy. And I am of the real, genuinely held opinion that just being in the garden like this, with its colour, largely green, with the um, atmosphere, which is, which is calm, bird song, dappled light, but beyond that is this whole idea of the of the extra oxygen that would be in here and the other, um, what do they call them, uh, you know the vapours and the essential oils that are in a forest that are being released by the leaves of trees and plants all of the time. I think breathing those things in and just generally being in a calm environment is probably the most valuable thing anybody could do in terms of their own health. Rather than taking supplements, even, even uh, more uh, influential than eating good food, I think, is just being in a space like this. And I know that the idea of forest bathing um, is getting purchased worldwide, particularly in Japan, but it can happen anywhere. This property is only roughly a hectare, hectare in size, but the, um, the number of pathways, the number of special spaces, the amount of vegetation that grows in a small area like that is quite phenomenal. And it's, it's common for people visiting and walking around the garden to stop when we're about a quarter of the way through and say, how big is this place? Because the winding paths and the three-dimensionality of it all makes it seem much, much bigger than 
than, than it would seem if it was if you were just looking at a you know a planar pa uh, paddock, much much bigger. So I've got bamboo growing here, and in uh, this is a particularly nice bamboo. It's a, just a small example. It's a new, fresh. It hasn't been planted for very long, and I've got much larger clumps of this particular bamboo. People are frightened of bamboo in some countries because some bamboos are running and they do, um, they are, I wouldn't say aggressive, no plant is aggressive, plants don't leap out at you and, uh, and attack you, but it's certainly, uh, it's a quick grower and it takes up space and people in small, uh, you know, urban gardens don't like that. But there's so much room in this garden that even with the running bamboo, I have no fear at all, it just has to take its place. <laughs> But um, this bamboo is a clumping bamboo. It's got so many uses and it's very beautiful to watch. It catches the wind um, more easily than the other larger, you know. Uh, it's got a lot of sail area, so it's a very expressive plant. Now, it, it brings in my, to my mind um, Japanese and Chinese art in a lot of ways and, and almost the sort of Taoist Zen thinking, I think a lot of that springs from the bamboo, a plant which shares its nature with, um, with humans and becomes part of our uh, philosophical um, weave, fabric I meant. In behind there there's an interesting plant with the very large leaves. This is a um, gunnera or when I first uh, found it, it was known as um, Chilean rhubarb and I, I never thought to eat it. And that's another thing about a garden like this is even though the planting's largely done, I suppose, a number of the plants here, I'm constantly learning new things about them. Not because I study online or study books, but because visitors who come here, particularly those from other countries where those plants are commonplace, will say, in the way that a Chilean, young Chilean woman who was here said to me, oh, you can eat that. I thought, really? Because it doesn't look like it. The leaves are quite, uh, quite rigid and the stalk is, um, has small soft thorns on it. But she said, oh, just carve off, a, um, carve off a stem, peel the skin off it, dice it up into discs raw. It'll look like uh, watermelon, sort of a, d a deep, d deep pink watermelon and dip it into salt or salt and chili and eat it raw. And I tried it. Uh, and it's very good. So having plants like that in the garden that at that stage I didn't know had any particular use. It just looked spectacular. It looks quite um, as though dinosaurs might be moving through the area. Um, but to find out that it's edible was a, is a bonus. And on top of that, nobody else or very few people know that that's an edible plant. And so if ever there was a um, you know, a social difficulty of some kind where people were rampaging around stealing potatoes from other people's gardens, if, if you understand the scenario I'm referring to. I don't believe it's going to be like that, but if it was, aside from finding out through, through listening to me talk now, people won't know that that's a food stuff, so nobody's going to come and, and uh, steal that plant. This one here beside us, um, it, it, this is Balm of Gilead, and as we go, as I take people on a tour around the garden, I like to stop here and say, um, have you smelt this plant? Crush a leaf and, and have a sniff. And inevitably people go, oh, that's amazing. Oh, that's a beautiful plant. What is that? So again, I say, <laughs> balm of Gilead. And I say to people, you can use this plant um, uh, and, and just rub it on your skin uh, to keep uh, sand flies or mosquitoes at bay. I think it's true. I think I read it somewhere. But because we don't get sand flies in this garden, and I'm not certain why, uh, I haven't really had a chance to test it. But it's, uh, it's a nice plant because it's easy to get seeds from it, especially at this time of the year. And um, people can take those away with them and grow it at home. And then, uh, then they've got this lovely, it's very attractive. It's like a herb tea style of a plant, such as a um, lemon balm or lemon verbena, um, but in fact this one's a bit too pungent to be used as a tea. But as a semi-medicinal plant, that is, you know, keeping insects at bay, it's perfect. I also like to strew it on the floor. We have a, we have a, a performance area. I like to strew this on the floor so people, when people walk on it as they go through to take their seats for whatever they're going to watch or listen to, 
um, they're walking on Balm of Gilead and, and the fragrance comes up and it's very, it's very lovely. Uh, further, further through here, through this veil of, of hop plants, which you can see is clambering up even, even our fruit trees here. This, uh, and this has got some nice fruit on it still. Most of the apple trees um, have been picked. It's the time of year where oh, I'd say 60 or 70% of our trees have been harvested from. Almost everything in the garden has been harvested at this stage. There are still pears on the tree and quinces. Um, and some apples, and this apple here, um, if I could think of its name, which I can't presently, but I will in a moment, is a very striking, uh, almost a lumpen kind of an apple. It's a cooking apple, um, and it's, it's fruited, it's a tip bear, it's fruited quite heavily this year, and you can see the fruit weighing down the ends of the branches. But I have gone round and released a lot of the fruit off this tree because I didn't want it. Um, Werner's King, that's the name of this fruit. It's Werner's King. I didn't want it to break branches. A number of the other apple trees that we've got here did um, were too heavy in their fruiting this year. Even though I have taken our beehive away, our honey beehive, because I felt we were getting too much fruit. Um, and the trees were under pressure at this time of year, and so were we. So even though we have family who comes and help, helps us pick the fruit, we really can't keep up. So that's a, a hectare of ground that's producing so much, and that's just in the, you know, the gross, the big fruits, like apples and pears and plums and nectarines and peaches and so on. So much fruit that we simply couldn't harvest it. A lot of it was falling on the ground which to my mind is fine because all those sugars and, and um, you know, fruit nutrients are going back into the soil and it wasn't causing any disease issues at all. However, it did seem a bit wasteful, especially when people were walking around and seeing a lot of fruit lying on the ground. They would always, I got the impression that they felt, maybe you could try a bit harder. So I figured if I took the um, beehive away, and all that honeybee activity was gone, then the native, uh, or the lesser, I suppose, no, not lesser, but other pollinators, we call them the alternative pollinators, but I wanted to make those alternative pollinators the pollinators here, the little native bees that burrow down into the, into the clay banks and so on, and the bumblebees. So rather than having to manage a hive and you know, buy a suit and a, and a smoker and so on, which we did, um, I just wanted it to be a more natural system. But even so, even though I took away that hun uh, honeybee hive, our um, pollination, our fruit set's been so high. And this, this, is, this year is not the highest year, um, but even so, there's a lot of fruit around. As we go further down into the um, forest garden, you can see how dense it is, but at the same time, it's open to the sky. So there's enough light here uh, to produce fruit. These raspberries fruited very heavily this year. One disadvantage I have, uh, a personal disadvantage, is that I'm red-green colorblind. And so when red fruits are ripe, I can't see them at all, and particularly raspberries. They're just invisible to me. I can walk straight past heavily fruiting raspberries and not see them. But I've got a very good wife, and what she does um, is she gets up early in the morning before the birds have really gotten busy on the, on the raspberries. And we don't net, especially the raspberries, um, so it's a, it's a battle in a way between us and the birds, but Robin will get up, go around and pick a bowl of raspberries before breakfast and then I can get up and, and enjoy those. But there's a lot of light in here, um, which means things can fruit well. More red currants. Up here we've got uh, peach, uh, pears at least, lovely old-fashioned heritage pear varieties that we had grafted because the grafting's a tricky process. This is a quince over here which has been picked and that was a quince that I grew from seed. So even though the theory is better to, it's better to buy grafted fruit trees, I'm not entirely in agreement with that, especially if you've got enough room to experiment. So down through here, um, another of those plants that not everybody recognises, 
the um, Jerusalem artichoke. Again, it's a food and it produces a lot of food in the form of tubers at the base of the plant. But people who don't know the plant won't know that it's something that can be dug up and eaten. And you can never dig them all out of the ground. So no matter how much is taken away, um, there will always be a crop of Jerusalem artichokes. In a very good year, the, uh, in terms of uh, climate and weather, these will flower with their lovely small sunflower-like yellow flowers. This year has not been the best in terms of uh, in terms of weather conditions and so I don't think these ones will flower even at this late late stage. Although over here we have a similar plant. This is one of my favorite understory plants. This is um, elecampane and that's the flower of elecampane. The seeds will be forming uh, shortly in behind it. Elecampane is a medicinal plant aside from its, all its other qualities and that it's very tall and very beautiful. Um, and it's the root of elecampane that's used as a, um, to improve the health of your lungs. So stewing a piece of the root on the stovetop and breathing the vapours of the elecampane. Very um, efficacious, if that's the right word. Efficacious, very effective as a, um, you know, if you've got something wrong with your lungs, be that just if you've got the flu or if you've got um, uh, bronchitis or something along those lines. So through here, at our feet, um, is another plant which had caught me by surprise in terms of edib edibleness, edibility, and that's the hosta. These are young ones that I have grew from seed last season. I've spread hosta right through the garden now because it um, is very nice, a very pleasant uh, plant to eat. Uh, in, the, in the spring, when it's first come, when the spears, first, the furled leaf first comes out of the ground, to cut those and to fry them in butter is a very um, good food, uh, delicious and easy to grow because they're a perennial. Once they're in the ground, um, they're there forever and you, we can just harvest those as we need them. Ducking underneath these apple trees here and this, um, this big old plum tree here is a good example uh, of the management in a garden like this in their effort to have uh, um, openness to the sky and to be able to walk through it. I prune this quite heavily. Well, at least I prune out a lot of the entanglement. So they're quite open. All my plum trees are quite open. But you can see at the base here where I've done a lot of pruning, I've just left the prunings lying there, and this is creating this extra moist and um, vibrant um, medium through which the fungi will grow, and already the understory is filling back in where I've laid those branches down. So there's no loss of no loss of production and no exposure of soil, which is so important. Through into this little glade. Here, I have, you can see that I have started using the coppicing system to manage some of the larger trees. This is a Chilean wineberry, Aristotelia chilensis, I call it. But if you look down into the base, you can see how big it was when I cut it with my handsaw and how um, the new growth has come away so rapidly. It means that I've been able to open up a space allow the sunlight to get through onto trees that fruit like this one beside us here. This is a Himalayan strawberry tree and if I show you one of those strawberries here you can see the size of them. It'll get a little bit bigger than that and then it'll go soft and dark pink and that's an edible fruit. What was happening is it was getting too close in here. There's a lot of those fruits just over here on the sunny face. So it's quite a productive tree takes no management at all except a little bit of pruning around it and it'll produce fruits over and over and over. So the magic of those perennial food producing plants as opposed to annuals such as well uh, lettuces and carrots and the kind of things that you find growing in the usually growing in somebody's vegetable garden that have to be re-sown each season that's still a good thing and we still do have some of that management going on here but in the main I'm looking at long-term perennial plants that do produce food as well. This is an example of the cow parsley here which would be 
the most numerous of all my plants would be these cow parsley. They've spread everywhere through the understory and as they rise and fall, rise and fall with the seasons, uh, producing a huge amount of vegetative material that goes back into the soil to feed the bacterial um, populations that are in the soil. It's the lignin and the wood that feeds the fungi, but this kind of uh, stuff, these kind of leaves and, and uh, stems and so on that feed the bacteria. And e even an opportunist uh, grape vine growing up, it's not going to get very far because that um, this is a biennial, this uh, cow parsley, and so it'll collapse down after it's seeded. But this vine will make its way, as you can see it already has here, that's a grape vine growing up the sunny face of a um, Himalayan strawberry tree. But as I walk around I can feel the ground is springy, it's moist in here, it just seems to be the most healthy environment you could possibly have for plants. At least to my mind it is, but because I don't live in a desert or in a polar region I'm sure it's different elsewhere in the world. But for what we need here for the amount of growth we get, the health of the garden, it just seems as though everything has come right. Everything is working the way uh, we hoped it would or that we read that it would. This is another tree that I've coppiced here and again you can see it at the base, you can see the old trunk there. No harm comes from, from cutting these every few years and the new growth that comes away is so much more manageable. This is a um, Gilda Rose, one of the viburnums and it fruits quite um, readily. There are other ex older examples that are covered in fruit, or they were up until just recently when the birds have taken most of them. But this is a fruit, this is a plant that produces fruits, but beautiful flowers. And flowers are something that I'm really, that's what I'm moving into now, is filling the garden with flowers. Over, over here you can see the, um, I, I'm going to guess that they're blue. My colour vision doesn't always serve me right, but these are the hydrangea, the lace cap hydrangeas that suit this dappled light of a forest garden so well. And they don't really attract um, flying insects the way other plants do, um, nor do they produce edible fruits, but they really do. They really are beautiful and they suit the light. So I think that feeding your soul through flowers and um, Flower growers know all this already, but this is something that came later to me as a forest gardener because I was always thinking about trees, but now the finer qualities of flowers and the value that that has to your health and to your spirit, I think it really, uh, it's really important. So I'm exploring now the different kind of flowers that will thrive um, in, this, in this dappled light, the dappled light of a forest garden. This is a hazel, lots of nut trees suit suit this environment, this hazelnut. This is a baby sprung from the parent tree over there. This is just grown from a nut. Hazelnuts are great in that they reproduce themselves quite quickly, either through fallen nuts or through um, offshoots coming off roots. So it's just a matter of moving those around. Already this garden is fairly full of that size of tree. So I'm giving away those hazels out into other projects that we've got or people who want to do something similar. And this idea has spread very well in our village. There are even in this street several properties that have been bought and planted out. They're at the early stages now but planted out in, in the in the same way that this garden was planted out and often using similar plants because I've provided them for them as an encouragement for them to expand this garden right out through the neighbourhood and through the village and then through the region. Um, and that, that's another story, but there are ways of getting your ideas out there and made real, uh, which is actually to me a very important part of a garden like this, is that it shouldn't be contained by your own physical boundary, it should spill over and um, reproduce itself throughout. And I think the way to do that is through generosity, is, is give a lot of stuff away. I love to give away a tree to someone who I know is going to take it, plant it at their place, and then they will care for it. But I regard it as, a, as an outrigger of this, this waka in, in a way. Another plum tree here that's been uh, pruned very wide and open, uh, 
fruited so heavily one year ago that one of these large branches collapsed under the weight of the plums, which is quite extraordinary. Um, a whole range of dogwoods, and down here we've got uh, peaches and nectarines, apples, a whole uh, line of um, walnuts between us and the forest, uh, the native forest in the background there. So there's no end to uh, what you can grow here, it seems. Bananas are a challenge, but I do have a very nice banana plant growing in a tunnel house, large tunnel house that I've got um, tucked away in the garden as well. So I'm willing to try everything. One of the plants I really love over here is this loquat. It's only a young loquat at this stage. It's making a nice form through there. And the reason why I've planted a loquat is because as a boy, I ate a lot of loquats. I lived further north. I lived in Nelson at the top of the island. They grow easily there. So I'm trying them here. I'm filled with uh, expectation and hope. I'm sure they'll fruit for me. And I'm very patient. I wasn't, haven't always been a patient man, but as a result of this kind of garden, I've become, I can look into the, into the future 20 or 30 years or however many years I've got left and um, be quite calm about the idea that I may not see those fruits until then. I just don't mind because I started that 30 years ago and, and have been harvesting and benefiting from the fruits of those labours so long ago and I see how the process works. I can't lose, I, fi I figure. I'm just adding to it as we go along. This is a beautiful flower. This is a um, Indian knotweed it's called. It's regarded not very highly by some agencies who might think of it as a, an invasive plant or something that should be watched over. I'm certainly watching over it and while it's not spreading out of control here um, as the climate changes I am watching a lot of these things but even the grapes could become a challenge, the hops will become a challenge. Kiwi fruit which I've got planted here amongst the trees can become um, you know, uh, overly vigorous and, uh, the way they have in the warmer parts of, of the country. So I'm always watching these things to see how they behave. You can hear bellbirds singing up in the trees here. They like to come in to the garden at this time of the year. Where they are at other times of the year, I'm not sure, but they come in here now where, the, where there's a lot of fruit on the trees, which um, is so ripe, it's now, they're normally nectar feeders, so I guess some of those, particularly apples, ripe apples, will be like nectar. I noticed that the process involves a blackbird who will come in first and pick the hole in the apple while it's still on the tree, and then when the dew falls, the way it did this morning, the bellbird will come in and sip the nectar from that uh, cavity made by the, by the blackbird. It's quite a lovely process, and it's certainly worth um, losing some fruit for those birds because their song is beautiful. This um, tree that's just above my head here is another, I guess you'd call it medicinal, but it's more prophylactic in, in that by regularly eating the fruits of this tree, particularly for men I think, um, heart health is maintained. It's a Chinese hawthorn and like all of the hawthorn um, varieties, it's the haws or the fruit that forms on here. And there are only a few on this one because it's a young tree. There are some right here. These are the haws. They haven't reached full size yet, nor are they red and ripe. But when they are, they'll fall on the ground. They're easy to harvest. And uh, in the Chinese tradition is to um, slice these fruits, uh, dehydrate them, dry them, and then just keep them in your pocket, basically nibble on them through the day. And that is um, reputedly for heart health and repair of any damage that may have been done to your heart. And I, I totally believe that that is the case. But to have one of these growing in the garden and have access to, um, you know, your own pharmacopoeia, if that's the right word, you know, your own pharmaceuticals from your own garden with no effort is really special, I think. another open area where the, my grandchildren like to come and play. I've built a small structure here for them to play in, creative, uh, creative little area. And lots of fruit trees in here of various kinds, mainly apples which have been picked, a nice cooking apple here, um, called a Yorkshire greening, 
and this tree over here is a, a cornus mass, it's called a cornelian cherry, all picked now but with lovely fruits on it. So the different um, families of trees that, that fruit, uh, the, the range is vast and it's nice to have the best representative of each of those families, well the best that I could find anyway in the garden here. Around this little, uh, some, some apples are quite small, those are small apples, a little bit dark for the apples in here but as I find a tree that may or may not be thriving I can always prune above in order to let more light in. This corfi, this is um, this is an example of a New Zealand native leguminous tree that's providing that, that nitrate fixing service from the nitrogen in the air back into the soil so that all of the other trees can enjoy um, that particular skill or ability that that tree has to fix atmospheric nitrogen. And a lot of trees can't do that um, themselves. And so that kind of, you know, I didn't work all this out um, theoretically or you know in terms of mapping I just like to grow corfi trees and I know that when I when I put them in the ground they will do what they will uh, fulfill that role and it's the same with the comfrey here you know again I, I learnt earlier on that the value of comfrey and it's got a lot of qualities good qualities um, now I notice that the comfrey is uh, not um, no, it's not that it's not thriving, but it's reached its plateau because the light levels in here are lower than in an, o an open ground where comfrey would get perhaps, oh, I don't know if it would be out of control, but it would be much more vigorous. It's now settled back to be just this. We know exactly what we've got and it doesn't become overwhelming. There are still some nice native plants here from the, from the original plantings that I did. This one's got this leathery leaf, brachyglottis which was so useful in the early days with this uh, pale under tomentum underneath. In the early days it was only plants like this that could survive here because of those tough conditions. Now, now that it's so much more sheltered in here, a lot of these ones are just expiring because they're, they like to be thrashed by those harsh southern uh, salty winds. Um, and they're just pretty much giving up because it's too nice. But this is a tree that needed it to be nice, this is a Paulonia, and this will be the southernmost Paulonia, I imagine, in New Zealand. It's just loving it here. It's growing fast. It's got that very, very light wood, like um, balsa wood, and the large leaves. And I'm expecting bay, or, you know, offshoots to pop up, which they say is a problem in some parts of the country. But here it will be something that I really look forward to, because I can th then move those young ones out into um, another part of the garden. Over there toward the farm, because we're, we're on the edge of town here, and the farm is beyond us, beyond the uh, fence there. Uh, I've got lots of peaches from all around the country, really. The Hokianga Harbour up in the far north, I think you'd call it the far north, um, they're thriving down here. So the idea that you can only grow plants from your own bioregion in terms of fruit and food plants, that I think needs to be tested because these things are growing very successfully here. And also the climate's changing. So us forest gardeners or gardeners of all sorts, orchardists, need to be quite nimble and adroit now in the way we think. Because some of the old uh, beliefs that we held about only growing plants that suit your particular conditions, I don't think that's quite the way it was 10 or 20 years ago. The turnover, the change, rate of change, um, is so much faster and that makes me think of the resilience that we've got here because we've got such a range of plants and um, from lots of different areas from bananas right through to you know sub-antarctic plants like the bunui or the stilbacarpa lyali that I've got growing here the range is so broad that no matter what happens to the climate there'll always be a percentage of the forest which is just going to be loving it so that just adds to the security and resilience of a garden like this. Another thing that does is the, the moisture content in the soil that I mentioned earlier on and the general moist feeling of the, of the forest itself inures us against fire and the biggest test of, and drought because the moisture is there um, held in the soil. We don't need to irrigate. 
Um, and the only other thing I would think about would be animals. And in some parts of the world, it's, it's elk or uh, I don't know what kind of animals, uh, uh, woodchucks or something that come in and, and do damage in the garden. Here, the only thing that could really do any harm would be livestock and cattle in particular. And we've passed that test. We had six animals, six big cattle beasts come in through the fence, push their way through the fence at one stage. They spent three days in here while we were away. They trod on every square metre of the garden. They ate whatever they liked. Um, and when I came back, I put them back through the fence, went and checked for damage. Within a week, you couldn't tell they'd been in here. Whereas in, you know, in a bowling green or in an ordinary garden, a vegetable garden with flower beds and a lawn, that would have been a disaster. Here it was just nothing. So it's such a resilient garden that keeps reforming itself uh, and not sustaining damage, which I think is going to be important as the weather gets wilder, which is what I believe is, or well, the climate at least, changes and the weather becomes rougher. So this is a, uh, a gooseberry. It normally would grow wet particularly well in central Otago where it's dry and hot, but here our gooseberry crop this year was enormous. We, did, we had basket after basket after basket of gooseberries. So you really can't um, know for sure. What we're trying to do is cover all the bases. Grapes again growing up through the trees here. These ones are really getting a, um, really getting a go on and they're starting to clamber up even into the tallest of our trees. Very easy to manage, just cut them at the base if you don't want them. Over here there's an example of an apple tree with still some fruit on it, but that was fruiting so heavily this year, that's a rokewood, an Australian heritage apple, fruited so heavily that three or four of the quite large branches just crashed and hit the ground and we were harvesting fruit off the ground. So it's a very productive garden. Just a range of different plants, some of which are fruiting, some of which are not. This is an apple I, I would recommend. I'm going to talk now about two different apples. This, is, this variety of apples is called a pear main, and you can see the shape of the apple is pear-shaped, except upside down. I don't know if that's why it's called a pear main, but that's what, I, <laughs> that's what I understand. Very productive, late apple, that's why it's still on the tree, and a fantastic store, apple for storing. It keeps so well over the winter. Even if you just leave them on the tree, aside from some bird activity, They'll stay there almost right through into springtime. But if, you, if we pick them, which we do, and store them carefully, they'll last right through, uh, right through the winter and be in a very nice fruit to eat in the springtime. And just walking up through this way, well, there's, a, there's a lot of things to talk about, a, quite a range of things here, including a giant bamboo, which I'm trialing at the moment, and it's past its first winter. But here at my feet, there's an example of a black mulberry, which is exciting me. It's the first time I've grown black mulberry here. There's one here and there's one just ahead of us up there. Um, so because this is a, an area with plenty of open space above us, I'm looking forward to the time when this tree, and this is a long-term investment, when this tree's a large tree covered in um, black mulberries, which I love the taste of. So up through here, past this European hawthorn, which is like the Chinese hawthorn, similar qualities, past another black mulberry here, which is doing particularly well, is this tree. And this is an apple, which I highly recommend. This is a, and I can't say the name of it as well as Dutch pe people from the Netherlands can. I call it Belle de Boskop or Belle de Boskoop. And it is a cracker of an apple. It's a large apple, firm, stores incredibly well, has a lovely colour. You can eat it straight off the tree or you can um, cook it, you can make pies, you can make cider from it and it's just a, a very beautiful flavour, robust apple. Um, if I could only have one apple I think it would be this one, though my favourite tasting apple is the Merton Russet. Nevertheless this is the one I'd go for because its qualities are so so good. We'll walk through now reasonably quickly through uh, along this pathway in front of the house here and you can see that our house is really tucked into the garden and it, in fact it has garden growing right up to it and across the 
top of the veranda in, in terms of grapevines, so we're fully integrated into the middle of the forest really. But we'll head now toward the native part of the garden and we'll have a look at what's happening in there. You'll have to duck under and through and if you get a crack on the head uh, with one of those fruits you'll know about it because they are a very solid apple. Another lovely apple here which is fully picked, this was a Keswick Codlin. This is the earliest of our apples here, one of the earliest of our apples. It's a very light pale yellow apple which you really need to eat straight off the tree because it has, doesn't seem to have any storage um, uh, potential at, at all. It soon goes, um, uh, it's such a fluffy apple, it goes uh, flowery or it goes, mm, yes, soft quite quickly. There's an example of the bamboo I was talking about. It's got a name something like Himalia calamus falconeri or some such thing, but it's the bamboo growth this year has been phenomenal and you can see the new growth here. These are the new ones that are just heading for the sky this year. I've never seen any year like it for bamboo growth. So every year something thrives and some other things perhaps don't do quite so well. This is the year of the bamboo. And that's right out in front of our house so I can sit uh, at the dining room table and watch the watch the weather play with the bamboos. It's a very good indicator of what's, what's really going on out here in terms of the wind. So we've done something of a cycle around almost back to where we started, which was on the edge of the native forest, but walking through the, till we get into the native plants, um, Aside from this spot, you'll find it much darker in here. So it's not an area for food production. Food is you know, high energy production from a tree and so needs a lot of light. But in here, it's a different atmosphere altogether. Um, this is cooler, especially in midsummer. It's absolutely gorgeous in here when it's too hot to work out there. It's also a refuge for native insects and birds. It's a little uh, fantail piwakawaka, piwaiwaka, flying around us at the moment. Often there are kiriru or wood pigeons perching in here. You almost have to watch where you stand. Uh, they might drop something on you. Um, and as well, it's a place where ferns grow. So it's quite a different atmosphere altogether. But it gives another uh, habitat, another, uh, another pla a place where different kinds of plants can grow. So for somebody who, like myself who loves plants, the opportunities in here are quite different than they are out in the forest garden or in the, in the food production side of the forest garden. And one of the um, big pluses or bonuses um, in this area is the stream. And we'll stand, I think, from the top here and just look down, down into what where the stream flows and it flows from this point right down to the estuary which is about three or four hundred meters below us there. It's clear water, it's coming from a spring matched by the spring we've got just at our feet down there which is our own spring with water that comes up through the ground here. Beautiful clean water and in that spring there are a, a number of quite large and energetic fish named giant kokapu, which is a native fish here. They came to that spring from the estuary and they lived in the estuary as a very small little fingerling which eventually makes its way up. It's brackish, the estuary, it's salty, saline, fresh combination. But at one point in their lifestyle, life cycle they seek fresh water and so they swam up the stream which is unhindered all the way through to the estuary and because we've grown these native trees over it and provided uh, extra shade and cooled the water down it's perfect environment for them and they've wriggled across some of them have wriggled across into this spring here and that's where they live they seem to have set up permanently and they've grown and grown and grown into quite significant and, and very entertaining particularly for children native fish which people don't see very often throughout New Zealand now because most of this habitat has been 
destroyed for either farmland or for townships and cities and so on. So it's quite a rare treat to come to a place like this, especially because I didn't catch them in a net and translocate them into the spring. They came here of their own accord and I regard that as something of a stamp of approval from the wide world, the wild world, um, about what we're doing here. So perhaps I'll finish with that, uh, on that note, that my feeling is we're really doing a, we're really doing a good thing here, and that's being echoed in the in the way that um, the other creature, creatures other than us behave when they're in here, or the fact that they come here to find uh, sanctuary from you know the outside world, which isn't always as uh, welcoming, I think, as a forest garden.